Is that your question? What is black love? <laughs> Ooh, um. As it's existing and it's working on, um, and, and having capability, I think, of doing um, everything. So, so, so black love is, is really God and a ritual of godliness. Black love is really about loving black people, loving myself as a black person so that my truth in the world, you know, can be realized. Manje wa white, it kero love. Go, go, abo na ntono shuk manje. Ni paeli ko tanto ana giya. Appreciate ko tayo. That's black love for me. Black love is that strength, that resistance being able to take poverty and turn it into something beautiful. Do you think that uh, uh, Tobias Kotane is like black love? I don't know why we can say black that. <laughs> That's why I don't question like a black yeah. <laughs> so when we put black and love together, I get very confused. Black love is loving yourself first, loving your brothers and sisters, Those moral values that we were taught from a young age that you need to take back the bread. I had to do it because my family has to survive. And for me, that is black love. When we love each other as black people, it's never not political. Black love always disrupts, um, and black love is in itself a political weapon. Y'all think it's cool to kill black people and then get on paid leave? I'm waiting for a signal, man. Our love should embolden us. Our love should enable us. Can, can I show love without money? It doesn't matter if you're rich or not, man. These are things that have been programmed within you. Money is a white person invention. They came, they said, this is my thing. So if you want to get it, you got to look like me. Black people don't have money, don't have anything. Money is part of the things that we need to show love with. If ever you are somewhere and then you pass something and negotiate and you don't have to go to the house, you will have to go If ever what is go to the house, that means you don't have to go to the house. Now go to I think maybe we need to, to, to learn about, you know, the relationship man has with nature. You know, we're natural beings. We've learned wrong things around food. No one has really said to you that eating a whole lot of pup and meat is wrong. Maize is not our thing. It came in 1654 or whatever year um, the visitors came and obviously never left, but they left us with the corn. I think we as black people, we love white people more than we love ourselves. So in my mind, the image and how I see myself mm -hmm. is what I'm creating in the physical. It'll never really come to an end as long as white is labeled as the perfect race. We think they have everything and we don't feel the power and the faith that we have in each other. Appreciating someone who's blacker, if there's even such a sense. And then he said, if you was given $10,000, would you bleach your skin? And then he said that because he feel like life is harder for me being as dark as I am. For me, it's been more colorism that's affected me. Um, I lost a role because I wasn't black enough. Apartheid created a hierarchy. Mm. So in South Africa, you knew the darker you are, the less privileged we are going to be. Despite what has happened in the past, we should allow ourselves to love other people. As black people, we have so much pain and trauma. We're more worried about making ends meet than expressing ourselves and being there for, 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 for each other emotionally. Yeah. We've got mental illness because yes. <laughs> we are sick, because the society is sick. 
So how do you love yourself when you're sick? The most prominent call is now a black man yeah. to, the, to the suicide line. Mm -hmm. So many celebrities are depressed and they end up killing themselves because of you guys. I'm not scared of you guys. No ways, I'm not gonna die because of you, me. Commit suicide. Everything we knew about how to be, how to love, who we are, was removed from us. Black queer love is, is love in, in trying times. How do I reproduce with another man and claim that I'm an African? TV also has like this, this consistent development that black people are very unaccepting. Being feminine as a boy, no. Being transgender, what, what is that? Well, the aim is to make sure that we do protect the institution of marriage and uh, stopping homosexuality. But I thought that it was important for me to openly document my transition online. You can see, look at this. Fucking pimples are ending me. Like I said. I think at the end of the day, it's just about normalizing nice. transness, normalizing queerness. Black love with the community. We at war with ourselves. The attack on foreign nationals, for whatever reason, is a form of intolerance. Everybody just arrives in our townships and rural areas and set up businesses without licenses and permits. We are going to bring this to an end. And those who are operating illegally, wherever they come from, must now know. They are talking to us that to go back Go back where well from, if you go back to your country, go back to your country, we will attack you. Zulu-Lenas taking our job! Zulu! The idea of living in a capitalist world where it's only like one person who's supposed to be um, the great one or the only one. Black Twitter is both black love and black hate. Black like people are very likely not to support one another, whether in business, whether in corporate, or in general, because I guess uh, due to our history, we're all trying to make it for ourselves. Okay, let me break it down for you. White tears. White supremacy. White privilege. White bodies. White skin. White men. White consciousness. Whites only. Whiteness. 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 White people. White people. White people. White people. White people. White people. I need to stop you right there because white people. White people. White life. White people. White skin. A white supremacy. A white African. I'm trying to not speak about white people anymore. Or even just in generating the outrage against the whiteness. As I divested from speaking about whiteness, I started discovering black love as radical liberation theory. We got nothing left. The definition of racism, oppression, and slavery. Human equality is just a philosophy. Pay for university, then show them your abilities. Get a job and salary, then look after your family. Screw a job and salary, cause that's modern slavery. Focus on your legacy until you reach your destiny. Cooking in the kitchen, man, I'm spicing up the recipe. Roasting like a chicken, everybody wants a piece of me. Mentally, I carry massive artillery. Government is benefiting, gaining up some calories. Society, starving every day from poverty. Yeah, we die in every day from poverty. I think the biggest thing for me is understanding the fact that within blackness, the idea of humanity has been removed and destroyed and black people have been denied of access to humanity. And as much as what we've held fast to ideas of community and Ubuntu and whatever that looks like to us, we have in many ways internalized those ideas that we are not deserving of humanity and we enact that on each other. I know for a fact that a black person who is so anti-white and whatever would gladly sit at the table and embrace a white person if that meant that they have to hate on me as a gay person. 
I think that we have like a damaged sense of self as a nation, as families, as communities, as suburbs, you know, like all these different kind of like scopes of groups of people have like really damaged senses of self. Because the reality is like all our parents and our generation, all our parents are like severely damaged. A lot of the country is emotionally unavailable. We've been conditioned to devalue ourselves, to, 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 to hate ourselves, to see ourselves as less. In grade four, my was to I wanted to be on a group. I said a white person. Yeah, but I'm telling you, no, because they seem to have it easy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like you hate yourself for being black, Joe. We honestly, we're only starting to appreciate ourselves since Kuli, because you're understanding what's okay. This whole Black Lives Matter, you are melanin popping. Even yeah. being dark skinned, Joe. Yeah. It's yeah. only now, to be honest, where we are proud to be. I don't want dark skin, you're born yeah, yeah. dark skin. That, you know but it was never, that? if you want, if you want light skin, yeah. the ladies would never take a second oh, look man. at you. I would, we talk, nyam. There's sort of like a roadmap to blackness that has been put out and I feel like I have to walk it, right? With social media, sometimes there's this like high black, like, you know, I have the Afro, you can see me today. I have the Afro, I have the, you don't know what this Aztec, I don't know what the appearances are. <laughs> I have the garb, I have everything. And I know that I'm doing it for me. It's a statement for myself so that I can attach myself to some kind of blackness, but I'm struggling a lot. What is blackness to me? And I really see it, and because of the schools we went to, the Model C experience, it's just not being white. And so if it's not just being white, then what is it? We are actually fighting for survival one-on-one. -on -one. We find that a lot in our own communities as black people where we don't uplift each other and we don't um, clap for each other and go, yeah, yeah, keep going, keep going. So in a place like that, Loving somebody else is the hardest thing you can do when you, you never receive it back. When I go out there, it's a war. Whether you call me ugly, you call me a horse, you call me a bitch, you call me a whore because of how I dress, I don't mind. I'm going to a war but the award that I got paid for. It's mine! I can sell it! So when you look at me, you make your demons look better using me. Maybe in a month's time, you are fucked by eight guys. Zotwa is dry for three months. Mm. Then you call me a bitch. I talk about things that are spoken about me. I'm not your problem, Nina. I will never fuck your men. I'm trying to show that I can see, I can hear, and I know. But I am going nowhere. And how can you allow an ugly person to tell you fame, to tell you money? Lendo, you respect the way some of us are going. As a band, you never tell us. We're going to be working a store. When the customer, you want to be a more relax. But when a white person comes, we are jump. As in, when we see a retail store, when you mama go, I think I'm seizing. I feel I go, I'm at. What do you want? I'm at. No, ma'am, I'm here to help you. And she was like. I don't know history. And when you don't know like your history, you you can't you can't value yourself so like you you don't love black people around you you don't know how to work with each other how to speak to each other how to treat each other with love and even you know also like different tribes yeah even like with different tribes like we don't even understand how 
neighboring countries like Zimbabwe and Angola helped us back then, and we hate on them, like right now. In creating this communal aspect of what blackness is about, we negated building ourselves as, as, as people at a, at a human level. I think we live in violent times. I don't think that society has done their best at making spaces for trans people or making the world safe for trans people. I'm still struggling with self-love, mainly because of me being a trans man. And a lot of it also came from hearing things like, yo, man, being gay or being queer is not an, is an African. What we do is we create normative levels where we say we're all doing this, so that's OK. Is it? No, no one's asking that question. We're saying, once we get to this level, this is what we all deserve. From all the pain that we've had in the past, at least black people deserve, even individually, this much reward, this much joy. And at what cost is that joy? We don't ask that question. This thing of being, this is not how we do it, has, has sometimes and quite often been an excuse to be absent and to, and to live within the trauma. This thing of being, this is not our culture, or this is not us, can sometimes become an excuse to like live within the dysfunction. With every generation, we'll find a way of excusing what's happening then by saying, no, we've been in this for 50 years, we've been in this for 100 years, we've been in this to a point where everything is gone and we're still sitting saying that, no, 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 it's only been 300 years. If white people are 300 years ahead of us, Believe me, when you get to 300, there'll be 600 years ahead of us. I think that overpowers the conversation that we should be having about where we are, where we need to go, and actually calling out what we need to call out. I mean, you look at in the music industry, you've got these guys who leave these big record labels because they're saying that this cap uh, capitalism, you know, white people are exploiting us. They're going to open their own independent black labels and they hire black talent. Guess what do they do? The very same contracts that they are running away from, from these big white companies, are the ones that they're using to exploit their own. We want to have like decent lives, basic decent lives. That should be possible without having to repeat the crimes that we've been and subjected so to, at, you know? so good at black people at repeating those crimes. Yeah. yeah. Like the helper example, like oh. we are the, probably worse than a lot of <coughs> other people with how we treat, as if we don't know how uh, our moms or grandmoms or people in our families have struggled so hard and we expect to work really hard and get all the money, but then someone in your house is taking care of your livelihood mm -hmm. and your children mm -hmm. and your health mm -hmm. and your space. Mm -hmm. So at what point do I say, I appreciate the charity that you do for our community, but you are a problem because you just want to be the only one. I feel like we've been taught that there's only this much of the pie that black people can have. Okay. I mean, we're still living in a space where we're still having firsts, like the first black person to do this, first black person to do that, like in this country. Okay. So if you like taught that there's only this much for you and your people, somehow it becomes, instead of like trying to bring each other up, it becomes a competition, you know? The moment we are metric or varsity, I don't want to do that alone in your house. How can I go next door? Do you see that it's also, it ruins how we feel about love, how we show love to one another. At what point do we stop saying, I'm doing this because I was conditioned to do this when I'm doing it because I know it's wrong, but because in that moment it gives me power over the next person. If you have to live in a world where you have to not see the person at the window asking you for money in order for you to continue, that seems to me a kind of numbing of yourself. Mm -hmm. I don't know what kind of love you can have for yourself if you have to accept that I have to pretend that this is not another human being who I see and recognize.
because that's what society tells us, right? Like that if you're not moving, if you're not producing, then what are you're you? Unproductive. You're unproductive. You're lazy. You, yeah. you you're not worthy, right? These are questions I'm throwing out there and throwing out to myself every single day, right? I'm not profound enough to say, oh, um, you know, you can find self-worth or find self-love and stuff and in what you do and the fact that you're creating. Money is my daddy. Money holds my leash. Money is like, is like the dictator of my mental illness, the dictator of my self-worth, the dictator of everything. I have over 5,000 artworks that I've created in my lifetime since I started illustrating. I've been illustrating for six years. I only like three of the artworks I've ever made because three of those artworks have sold more than anything I've ever made. I feel like there's an inherent sense of anxiety with finances. I'm basing it back as an artist and, you know, you'd never know how to price yourself because you always feel that you're not worth it because this is something you like doing, this is something you have a passion towards. But also you, you view it in the lens that you're not skilled enough to, to actually price it in a certain way. What's hurting me is that I'm thinking that this worth thing is going to come when my client actually takes my, my invoice the way I gave it to them without question. It's going to give that take, but now, sissy, you've made it into the clubs. Whereas in, th the more I'm wanting it to come from the outside, the more I'm not getting it, and, and the more rejected and displaced I feel. I come from poverty, and I'll never change. So I want any girl to say, you know, look at, uh, at Zotwa. She always says she uses Vaseline. Look at my hair. You know, my hair is 80 rands, but the booking that I'm at tonight is 35,000 rand. So it's not about fitting in or changing who I am. I was enterprising by, by luck. Someone put me onto selling sweets in primary. I thought that, was, that shit was genius. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like flipping 10 rands into 20 bucks in a small packet of sweets, you know? And that's how I brought justice to myself from, from primary school. And that's what entrepreneurship has always meant to me. That's what mine has always meant. It's, it's there to bring justice. The first thing I thought, like, when I got a raise is like, fuck, I don't have to worry about raising my kid anymore. Like, yeah. you know, I can put him in a good school, like, can finally, like, things which were alien to me, like, just a few months ago, it's like, oh shit, I can buy a house, like, you know, I can live with my kid. I can just literally, like, you know, sort of, like, shield him off from the world. My father has this thing where, even my uncles, actually, like, as a black man, if they can't help you financially, he immediately feels worth nothing. Yeah. He will run away from questions. He won't answer my texts and all that stuff. So him just saying, I can't help you this month, money's tight, is harder than him saying, I don't feel good. So I feel like that whole understanding of how black men have been system to be like money, make money, make money. If you make money, you're the best. I can't understand it. Their version of showing that they loved us financially was to kind of hide the fact that there were financial problems mm -hmm. or that mm -hmm. there's a lot of like shame around not having. You develop a similar relationship to finance that there's kind of like a shame around ownership and the shame around like wanting to generate wealth. that happened for me around money. And I think a lot of black families experience this. Your family does well, and then it falls apart. Yeah. And you fall flat on your ass. And you watch your parent, who was your hero, diminish. Yeah. I think I'm unconsciously trying to extend my father's dream, which is a trauma in itself, because you watch the dream collapse with someone you love or someone you saw as a hero. Do I unravel myself out of his dream, my father specifically, and do the selfish, scary thing of like, what's mine? What's my dream? What will self-sustain me and give me worth? Or do I carry on in this choreography of like, if you didn't make it, I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna make a business and you'll see and we'll point at it that it's something our family owns or something we did. So I think my trauma around self-worth is that, is that I don't feel fulfilled unless I fulfill somebody else's dream. Last week I was broke again, so I called my dad and I was like, can you please borrow me money? He's like, but you, you have a job. And I was like, but you're my father. 
And then he's like, <laughs> and then we had this whole conversation about black tax. And he's like, what are you talking about? What is black tax? It doesn't exist. And I was like, no, it's a real thing. And then he was just saying, no, it's not black tax. It's Ubuntu, you know, when you, when you grow up and you make money, it's not, it's, you're not being taxed. You kind of have to, it, like, a community like brought you up. So you kind of have to give back to that community. And I, I don't know about that. Like, I think <laughs> I he's, he's, he's on something, but. <sighs> a black person's soft spot is when you hoi the word Ubuntu. Where's your Ubuntu? Then it's like, yo, it's you know, that's part. how you, like, <laughs> exa- it's the button. My issue right with the way that sometimes the conversation around ubuntu is positioned right in relation to money is that often it is at the expense of one person my mother in particular has kind of been the person that everyone has kind of been drawing from and drawing from and drawing from right and people kind of use the concept of ubuntu to keep sucking and sucking and sucking. And it's allowed for people to kind of go, okay, all your five siblings are gonna have seven children and their seven children are gonna have other 18 children. And all of those people are gonna be dependent on this one person. And you know, you kind of, you have to look after us because that's the Ubuntu thing to do. For me, it's a thing at the back that if you do make it, you know most that you're gonna now have to take Give care of everyone. all these people. So do you wanna make it? I want to go back to like this intersection between black tax and Ubuntu because I think it's becoming very much meshed and sort of crazy. And now the Ubuntu thing is sort of like, yeah, but you owe your brother. We have to, I think, I don't know, redefine or undress Ubuntu again. People are just hoying Ubuntu, Ubuntu, Ubuntu without actually figuring out how it is that everyone can play their part. We're confusing a sense of entitlement with Ubuntu. We all know that black love is rooted in the philosophy of Ubuntu and all of that, right? But my question then becomes, at what point do we as, as blacks, especially as um, black millennials, at what point do we take responsibility of the choices that we make in our blackness? We don't have the tools to manage relationships of any kind be it with your money, with money, with your body, with food. We just don't have the tools or our parents didn't have the tools. I mean, look, they were also trying to live and survive and raise children and not be dead. as black people like someone take even it's in a sense sapphires that's the thing it's <laughs> wrong <laughs> like umuntu mama nga tshela imali tsho now the only thing you going to think of is to keep mele bang bone mele ngisha isitwazo everything must be on point and then after that go zwa kalani igaulu you buy the expensive junk food like yeah yo ke lento days like is you bona i go see as tshwa ela nga zinye zazo you know not used to that standard inside now ma uthi lo wase tshizini bamfundisa ukuthi 10000 we beka lo wase lokushini because when I was born, I was born at 15,000, I 50 million. I was born at Timbaland, I was born at Tinia Levi's, I was born at one set. I was born at a figure, I was born at a two-liter Coke, I was born at a can. Yeah. You understand? Yeah, 15,000. We are spending. That gratification of coming from having nothing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because when I let excitement go to bra, yeah. at some point in my life I couldn't afford a proper pair of sneakers. Mm-hmm. They will know. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Bona la be bag laha but you can't afford. You don't have. So the moment you have some sort of cash, you just wanna let go. Bana that whole saying, I'm a licon, I'm a little. Yeah, I'm a licon, I'm a little. I have money now. You know what I mean? I can afford one, two, three, and four. Yeah, I'm materialistic. Someone can say to me, I only care about 
material. No, I care about everything. Look at my life, my life is not, it's not to rata or fail. Only love this one. No, I love this one, but I also love these ones. Na like to reki ki ka Paris so ne is because na ki batla u ipona ki re ki batla batho ba mpo ke batla u ipona ko mirenge re ya ne ke sha funo cuz na ke tswa backgrounding e peta like e poverty e extreme ba bona re dula kwa mi khukhu ngo renji farm o sna next na tv o sna next re sna di eta so ha ki ipona ke a pere de we na ki batla nga te ke a thaba with everything that's been said, right? Everything we've been talking about capitalism and systemic like oppressions and it's all those very you know, we've read the books and watched the documentaries. It's very big, but like, what is my everyday experience, yo? What does land mean to me? That <laughs> means that I don't own a house. I don't own land. I rent. And sometimes when I rent, they kick me out or something like that. I don't plant things. So I have to go to shop, right? And this is my everyday experience of capitalism. This is my everyday experience of displacement or landlessness and so on and so on. I can I own land. I don't have it, you know? <laughs> I don't. I mean, it would be nice to one day own a plot somewhere and build a house for my child and, 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 and right? But th right now, I need to like figure out how I pay rent, how I do this and how I do this, and paying someone who owns that property. So it, it's, I don't have like a direct kind of relationship to this ownership of something. There is a big thing about blackness and the roadmap saying you can't own anything. You can work towards it, you can be really good, you can be educated, you can be a good person even, you can tick all the boxes, but the ownership question is really a hurtful one. Mm. And knowing or sort of having in the back of your mind, I might not get to own this thing that I'm trying to build or I might not get to make it successful or whatever. For me, it's such a painful area, especially when it comes to money. It's like I work hard, I'm starting a business, I'm doing meetings, I'm doing things day to day, I read things and I'm not owning anything. So it makes my, my relationship with money as a black person very um, confusing. If I decide, Wuti, okay guys, I'm going vegan. If you want to decide, Wuti, you're going to want to live a healthy lifestyle, it's very difficult to access, you know. Sometimes it's not always by choice because there is no such thing as a healthy snack in the hood unless you're buying fruits. So it becomes very difficult. So you settle for, for the junk food and because you can afford to get that junk food like I as in for nothing Khalili pizza, only because it's called Masya Vum to Khalili pizza. What has happened over the years is that, you know, with us black people moving from the rural areas to the urban areas, our food has changed over the years. And what's happened is that your status is determined by the kind of food you eat. So you'll get a family, an up and coming family, they are rich, they've got money, they no longer need to eat morojo or need to eat sorghum because that's low class stuff. They're now eating all this deep fried stuff from fast food places and they're still suffering from malnutrition. What's the problem there? If anything, it's creating disease in the family. The good food has actually translated into poverty. And the bad food is what's seen as being affluent. That needs to change, because that's what's killing us, really. You know, people are dying from a low self-esteem. If you understood that, you'd understand that your, your self-worth is actually based on the good stuff that you're putting into your body, not the bad stuff. Just because it costs more doesn't mean that it's better for you. If anything, you are made to feel like when you eat morojo, you are whack. You're low self-esteeming yourself somewhere. You're not rich enough to buy meat. 
our way of life is not sustainable. That's why we're dying at such you know, young age. Our life expectancy, you, you're expected to live until 60. If you're over 70, yo, everyone is like, wow, you're 70. <laughs> what ends up happening is that people think to live a sustainable, healthy life costs a lot of money, when it actually doesn't. It's not something that's out there, something that will cost you an arm and a leg to be a vegan or to only eat seasonally or to eat sustainably is actually doable. The moms are the ones who need this information because they need to instill pride and they need to instill love in whatever they're making. Think of the diseases people have. I have sugar, I have BP. <laughs> These are black diseases. What is that? You know what I'm saying? Are they black diseases? And they, I mean, they are. We, people don't think about saying I have sugar, I have blood pressure. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what, even so, slow death, not even fast death, slow forms of slow dying. This is what anti blackness does in a capitalist system. Our participation in this real world is not neutral. All of us are not equally victimized by the system. Mm -hmm. And many of the ways in which we survive in the system is based on accepting that other black people must suffer. How do you talk about a black love when our just like daily modes of existence are predicated on black pain? Do we even embrace mental illness as black people? Do we discuss it? Do we talk about it? So it's really hard to say, even if I ask this person, what does it mean? They, they probably have never actually sat down and be like, oh yeah, I am depressed. The definition of what is mental health, we are saying. Oh, the woman is. Yeah. And you get sidelined. Yeah. But depression is not seen yeah. as, yeah. as, as yeah. mental health. Yeah. Don't you guys think of what it's in a black people who don't know what's depression? It depression is as as you are malung or any other people, you understand? Omuntu mara too depressed. We see it on TV, you go to this is depression. But you don't know within yourself, I'm literally depressed, guys, you understand? I come from a single parent background, right? It's my mom, single mother. Uh, she's like, a hustler, so she did all she could to give me the best and to not feel as if I was lacking anything. I went to the good schools, um, went to Rhodes University, and I left halfway through my second year, and it was due to depression. Everyone in my family, it was a thing of, how are you depressed? What are you depressed about? You are getting a degree, you went to a good school, your mom does so much for you, you're ungrateful. So it's an invalidation of you're not allowed to be depressed. I mean, there are kids on the street who are suffering way more than you. Like how, you know, so it's that whole thing of, I'm suffering from the trauma of depression and then the trauma of not being allowed to suffer from that depression and heal from that. The mental health is taboo at the end of the day. It's not spoken about. You're more afraid of the stigma that's gonna come with the fact that you have a mental problem. Let's say I'm climbing mountain, no problem, ne? And then I'm thinking, okay, thing you could manage. Maybe we have answers. Pin the foot to go by him and decide to manage. I'm a romance with some charger. In my family, personally, there's a there's a culture of secrecy around issues. So you find yourself constantly blaming yourself because you mythologize very real things. You can't name this thing because it's going to offend some people, or um, you just need to get on with it. And then it feeds into the whole cycle of basically neglecting yourself to get somewhere. But when you get there, you're already dead. My personal trauma, having been someone who deals with depression, having been suicidal, feeling like you can't speak about certain things because it's not like that and having conversations with other friends of mine and realizing just how miserable you are because masculinity says, but dog, you can't speak about this, you know, and keeping it in and, and, and becoming more and more miserable and, and having an abusive relationship with alcohol. 
There was a guy that was like on the first. The out here shooting at behind a girlfriend, the girlfriend that can call him cheater and stuff. Yeah. So, um, just that we need pinches to buy. But our corner, our land, our shoes, our money, our chair, our buffet, we no problem. So, we na go to Gumbo, na we feel that we make fresh song, your lal. And to go lala walk, go lala walk, we na get in line as fucking dumb. Cause I'm not moving, that's all ring and I. Cause I'm in my car, that's all figured. I have a problem with my girlfriend. The other thing. Mary, 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 regarding things like queerness, mental health. Anybody that is medically transitioning, whether you're on testosterone or estrogen, you're on that for the rest of your life. So there has to be a consistent supply. So when, when there was the shortage of testosterone for the past couple of months, some of my friends, they, they, they couldn't have their shot for two months. And that is depressing. It makes people suicidal. It, it literally is a life or death situation. No one knows about it. We carry the trauma. Like, we are supposedly like born freeze and you know, whatever. But in your actual blood, like, you carry that trauma, you know? Like, the trauma of people that you might not have even met by the time you were born, but by virtue of the fact that you're black. And you come from these circumstances, and your grandmother and your grandfather and all of these people, it, it's in you. Half of my aunts have, you know, when they say, Bane, hi, hi, it's not necessarily high blood, it's just like, there's a lot happening, you know, and it doesn't sound the same as what you would say. I'd be translating. The thing of me coming from a single parent background, my mom is a strong black woman, and things I can see the mental health issues on her, but like her herself, she's not willing to talk about that, yeah, and have that conversation, so it somehow affected me. Depression and mental illness runs in our families. You know, you're not the first person in your family who's suffering from anxiety. You're not the first person in your family who has depression. You're not the first person who realizes how shitty white supremacy is. It's just you're the first person, maybe. Articulate. Yes, to articulate, and in a very specific language, that's another thing we, um, we take for granted the way that our own languages speak to that, you know? We're the generation that identifies the problem and names the problem. You can't heal from something if you don't know what it is, if you don't know what it's called, if you don't know how it works. So that, for me, is, is weird. weird is now. So it's about, it's about naming things. It's about naming things and saying, this thing is real. And if we look at what it is and how it works, we can possibly find a solution. And we acknowledge that we don't have the tools yet. And maybe even an imagination of what it means to be well, to not be sick. And for a second, I want to imagine, when we say we're in a process of healing, what does healing look like? What does it look when you healed? If there was a possibility, what, it would, what does it look like for you to trust that the black guy at the other end of the boardroom isn't trying to fuck you over? What does it look like when these things are certain? Like, we can take these things for granted, that we're not at risk, that, we, that there's more than enough love, wealth, access, things to go around, and that you having doesn't mean you're taking from somebody. Yeah. What are we wanting to heal towards? Mm. Love is really hard. Like, really, really difficult. 
really rare. That's really scary. And also really dangerous. So when I think of black love, I feel you can't really talk about it. It's not really like a, a theory, you know? My grandmothers, they're almost like my ideal of black love. But in their lives, there's like nothing easy. Somewhere in that ugly space um, is where I find something a little bit uncomfortable, where this question of like a black love starts to be something kind of powerful, something meaningful. You know? So it's connected to things that are very, very ugly. Amongst ourselves and then also in how we have to operate um, in relation to those who are not black. I think black love to me is something that's a little bit of a myth because we are generally not loved um, as a population. We have to make a conscious effort to every day consciously go, okay, this is how I'm loving myself today or this is how I'm going to love somebody else today. When I was growing up, obviously, I was sort of, I didn't want to be black, you know. You want to be white because white is better. So for me, black love is new and it's like, it's like self-love. I'm actually like beginning to love the fact that I'm black. Black love, it's my skin, it's my hair. I'm born this way. I don't need to fix it or try to hide it. You know, with makeup, Peruvian, Brazilians. And it's not just like American women with Afros in Harlem who are like the images of, of black love. Blackness is being redefined and it has to be a performance art now. Black art for the young kids has to be a performance thing. Like, you can't tell me you love me because I'm black. Like, act it out, show me. Let's have conversations, talk to me, hold my hand. Tell me I'm fine, tell me I'm perfect the way that I am. Tell me my hair is great. Younger kids, like in our 20s, we need reinforcement. You need to kind of say it. And not of that hard dad love type of thing. Like, my dad has never said he loves me, but I know he does because he takes care of me. It's not enough anymore. Because you're taught at home, Muguti, as a man, you don't just show feelings because it's a sense of weakness. About man's calling it nyaktanda every day, you start getting annoyed with him, and I'm starting to feel uncomfortable about it. About there's no way. Hence, my city black love. Instinctive, what people think about first is material. That's an I love you from your dad. When he buys you something, that's an I love you. And it's a struggle now for us to having to express feelings not only to each other, but now to women as well. completely divested from the idea of black love um, on a romantic, um, on a romantic um, scale. And that is because it just seems, uh, for the most part, and especially with South Africa and gender-based violence and all of this, that like the burden of continuing this black love and to realize it and to make it flourish and, and exist it lies on you know, black women, black femmes. Um, you know, we're the ones trying to teach and steer society to a better place. Black love. <laughs> no. I've worked, I mean, I've had colleagues who spent 20 years with love letters written between people, and they never imagined that African people were capable of having an interior life. So they never thought mm -hmm. of them as love letters. They used them to check evidence of like <coughs> where with MK competence hiding. For me, it's a political act to think about black love. Black love at the moment is about coming back to a place of reclaiming and regaining and re-recognizing that humanity and being reintroduced to ourselves as human beings first, outside of the structures that define us as not. Just black love, when I think of it immediately, it really feels like a utopia. It feels like where we're all trying to, where we're struggling to get to once we're like post-capitalist, post-patriarchy, post-everything. It feels like then we'll have um, the conditions of possibility for this love to exist because right now, everyone and everything is just so fragmented. Um, it's so hard to imagine 
all of the the kind of you know oppressions and the kind of violences that we need to like transgress in order to get to a place where black love can be a real thing. From when we started, what is black love? I mean, for me right now, most importantly, it's it's closer than you think, right? Yeah. It's in your friendships. I've been to people's funerals sometimes just to support a friend. But like just like being in a church and like looking at like Bumabako next door or about society or whatever, like just coming together to come help and support this family. The strength of that and the love in that in its own, that makes me emotional, brings me to tears. Because that's like love that's always been right in front of us. And we don't have to go too far to go search for it. It's right under our noses. Nostalgia for me is what I connect to black, black love. Um, and I guess there's a oneness about it, you know. I think love for me is being able to find a reflection of yourself in someone else. And that's why you're able to exchange ideas of dignity, respect. It's much easier to exchange that when there's that sense of oneness. I think of teaching as a practice of black love and I, and I insist upon classrooms where people don't feel punished, where people don't feel like they know nothing. It's my intention to affirm what people know. There's kind of a, a practice of empathy and intuition that I emphasize in terms of myself as a teacher, but also the, the rules of conduct for the classroom space. There are people that when they get into a space, they bring light with them. They bring that love with them. It doesn't feel like they're giving something away or whatever, it's there. So I think when you have that, you inherently light it up in other people. You make people happy just yeah. by your presence. Yeah. Thinking about black love has also for me been healing in the sense that I've been asked to engage with myself as someone with a soul and as someone whose freedom in terms of what it means to love another person is also to give to love them in the kind of way that gives them of their freedom. Um, and that's been super enlightening and wonderful and confusing, I just wanted to say. We're pretty much doomed. The world is very anti-black, the world is very anti-femme, the world is actually very anti-human like human in many ways, um, regardless of race, gender, etc. And so I'm really interested in like rupturing that fuckery for a little moment. When we have conversations, there's always this thing, are we really doomed? There's never a solution. We do the work for the solutions. We solve problems using books that are relevant to us, books that talk about issues that we go through. We get storytellers to come in and tell African stories. We've all grown up with Roald Dahl and other European material, so we're trying to get our own material. People have psychological problems, physical problems. Hence, we thought of doing a physical, holistic, conceptual. So we have capoeira, and we have Kundalini Yoga every last Sunday of the month right here at Mofolo Park. We do mind-body-spirit sessions for kids and for adults as well. What I learned about Capoeira is that it balances part of your brain so that it can align properly. You learn how to do that through movement and through breath. With Kundalini Yoga, it's the same concept. So we're thinking, take something that's done upmarket, bring it to Soweto, and get people to learn how to take care of themselves. We have a hiking program called the Walk of Giants. We're trying to pair them with a mentor who's in a professional world, and to walk the path with them up the tracks. For the kids, what they bring back home is not just the experience, but a healing. They can also talk about whatever desires and be taken serious. they get serious. to express themselves to the mentor as to what their dreams are, and then that person is able to help guide them. Having five boys has also awakened that to say, you know what, we've got a responsibility here, you know. Even in the community, you know what's more imperative, and you become selfless and end up doing the work that needs to be done without 
expecting any reward. There's a lot of people who would like to help, but it's easier for them to join help. in and yeah. just contribute. He told me what they were doing, right? And I told him, I'm gonna come through because what you're doing is in line with the kind of food I want to cook. I want my people to taste. We need to nurture what we are inside, you know? And nurturing the soul means you need to keep the body healthy because the body carries the soul. With me, I've always had issues of self-love. He's brought that, he's shone that light in me. It took tears, it took positive self-talk. There's a Japanese guy, he was speaking to a glass of water. It took an ugly shape, actually, when he said negative things. And when he said good things, it was beautiful, you know? Um, so I think you speak life into things. You speak life into yourself as well. You speak life into other people. You can talk to animals. You can talk to plants for them to grow. We somehow underestimate the power of words and what they can do and the energy that words come with, you know? I see myself in you, and I don't see how I can not love myself. You're reflecting me. She's taught me to actually be responsible and be like stand up and go for what you want. Because I never used to be that confident. I think starting a family, growing together, being in that position has taught me these traits to be able to stand on my own. Because I was just a boy when we met. You know what I mean? So even though you're a woman, I learned how to be a man by being your man. You know what I mean? So I love you for that because you're taking out what I didn't know I had in me. Every time I teach, I also learn. Every time I experience something new, I learn from it. I love my work because it makes people happy at the end of the day. It's a solution to other people. If I can affect one person, they can affect two people. That's what makes me happy. That's the reward I get from somebody else walking away saying, thank you, you've changed my life. We're not here for just ourselves. You're here to leave a footprint. You're also here to help change other people for the better. The first thing that comes to mind is community and how I cannot imagine particularly the last four, three years of my life being possible without the community that I've been able to cultivate in my life. For a lot of us, like, our given families are not that safe space for us, so the older you get, you kind of cultivate family and community that you can kind of call safe space and, like, holding space. The reason why, again, uh, repush up Kotan is because we know it's gonna grow. If you can see how kids love us, man, in the streets. Yo, 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 yo. Basta nyaka ko nende ba na wakbo na wato hula. Rabata ata. Lanzer pila life saron. Rabata once le rabaruta. Baba ngo na luba ruta vele rabwa kenye like baba le rona sometimes. Akere pila ka ofel. So rona loye tete tana din chote din. Like Sometimes must or anything. We are Mang man, kitchen boy, nal chalet, the drum, with like regal, and ying, ah, a guy yens riding there. Shumaga bandulu, like a kate, sunk a mask guy, see for me. Abo. The moment to go is as I only means it's not one hour to go on our own, I Since from day one, I stand up to this cotari. Um, go here and eat a evil thing, I understand. In a room, I'm telling you, I'm going to same day. After that time, I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go
Dabei auch like, like hier ja maybe outdoors und stuff, but war ich aber schon ja 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 Metal kann ich finden. Like, but they to a certain event though anywhere and then so one year or not two year or near like in a certain way. But when not just in total material, I'm not to ah, I say right. I say it's okay. If we have anything like that, go get it. Kenya go do it. Get some tricky. Like feel a compassion from two. But when get get Kenya that get motivated, spiritual. Besides in total, most of the things are connected to material. And then, I'm not a real material culture. By leading to the tamo, yeah, you know, the feelings and stuff. Rabu, I just that Rona is like regularly have fun too much. Because the the intota wo mal la te adi ta al padi ta la sometimes and reba there for each other when when they happen. Or when it the kick give or give and take relationship all the time. Le na to na so ka tu so baba nga ta like wa ko no kupa na ona baba nga ko no ba kupa ka tu sa na ko ne sa. So I saw like we na lim tu one. I can use some praise or hey, when that door opens, receive it. Oh no, go feel like oh my, oh my, it's when I look like a brotherhood. I'm finding, I start like learning myself and learning where I fit in society, and I feel like that's what black like, love is to me: is mm. finding yourself within a community, but still finding a sense of unconditional love for each other and yourself. You know. For me, it's about <coughs> managing my personas. So I feel like I have like several personas, and some of them are effective for world stuff, world breaking go get a da da da, maybe I have two or three there that work quite well. And then there's this other person that I'm now able to nurture, take care of and share with the people that are closest to me. It's almost like a defensive thing to manage your relationship with capitalism and every other ism out there. It's like keeping alive and then actually living, you know? And that's what I'm trying to work out, whether that's a real thing, but so far just learning the gentleness of being, just gentleness, je, je, enjoying gentleness, being gentle, feeling <laughs> safe to be gentle, receiving gentleness, huge, huge for me. And that's where I heal. Just not responding to everything as well, just like, you know, like maybe logging on to Twitter and someone sets you off and you feel compelled to respond mm -hmm. to them. It's just like, I, you know, I just let it go. Abandoning my obsession with rightness, for me, there was a tendency to want to be right, to get validation from other people. That then determines my value. You guys take yourself seriously, You're thinking you are better. Remember before the social media, who are you? You are someone. You are, you are at home, you are at work. You are someone, like you are, you are someone like me. The fact that I had to go initiate as a Sangoma in 2019 speaks to the trauma that is still very present in my blood. Because I, I'm probably the first person in my family after like three, maybe even four generations since like the last healer. So there's been quite a number of years since the last person in my family like went in for initiation. And that is part of the trauma to be like, there were people in my bloodline who were healers but could not be for whatever reason. I think a lot of people don't understand that first and foremost, Mautwasa, you do it for your bloodline, to bring healing to your bloodline, and then you do the work with Ilozilako for other people. 
I want to do something that that helps me to heal and what helps me to heal is what creates conditions for other people's healing. I'm all about teaching people how to love themselves with the food that they eat. Food is love and it's also life. It became my healing place and it became a place for teaching. I, at some point, was diagnosed with hypertension. I immediately had to change my way of eating. For me, I went into learning about food, learning about food that can sustain me, that, that's delicious, that's not expensive, and that's where my journey started. So I don't have to kill myself trying to eat food that's good for me. Part of the journey that I'm on around sustainability is finding out what is ours. And by us, I mean what's indigenous to Africa, to South Africa. What's local here? For me, this Morocco is local. Sorghum, on the other hand, our grandmothers used to grow it, used to make it. All we know about sorghum is that you must make beer and get drunk. <laughs> but it's actually healthy. It's been. Um, it was declared a, a superfood by the UN. So it's one of those grains, ancient grains, that we as South Africans and Africans need to eat more of. And it's ours. Again, people know sorghum, but they were just like, oh my word, I didn't know I could eat it like this. All I know is ding and I don't like ding. You know, people already have these notions about food that obviously, again, it's learning the wrong things as we're growing up. I know what to teach my son. I'm teaching him how to make his own food, how to actually take care of himself. Because, you know, if he leaves and he goes to varsity and he's staying on his own, he'll understand how to eat. And he'll, he'll actually be more aware of what's out there in terms of ingredients and how he doesn't necessarily have to eat junk food all the time to sustain himself. With healing, I've never been intentional about it. I feel like it's... It's always been forced. Sometimes I heal from shit I didn't know I, I suffered from. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, man, that shit is fucked up. <laughs> That's, I don't wanna lie, it's the most fucked up moments of my life, you know? It's been very important with what I do with my life because in the pursuit of justice, um, when you're young, sometimes you, you approach it from a place of anger and healing allows you to, you know, work from a place of love because now you've understood. This is healing right here, right now. Do you know, because there are certain things that we as individuals don't want to confront. Do you know what I mean? Like right now I'm telling you that I, I don't have any trauma. I don't, I don't know. Maybe when I'm like 40, 50, then I'm going to look back and say, damn. So you're saying you're suppressing your trauma? I'm saying maybe because now I'm listening. I'm saying uh, right now I don't see it as that because I've, I've never allowed myself that luxury of, of believing that I, I, I have a problem and whatever. Maybe for a month or two as an adult to live with your parents, just like see how they are as people who didn't always have all the answers, right? What kind of healing can come out of that, you know? And you can say like, listen, at a time like this and this and this, I felt like I, I wanted to speak to you about it, but because of this, this is how I thought you'd react. How do, make, do I make this a better thing for my kids in the future? Or, you know what I mean? Just have dialogue about the, your traumas and her traumas and so on and so on. That creates another kind of conversation for other things, yeah. you know? It's tricky to teach our, our parents, bruh. Yeah, bruh. You know what I mean? Because you are telela, first of all, you are telela. First of all, you are telela. Uzo chela me na wen, uzo chela wen, 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 uzo chela me wen. For me, I feel like having a very, like a very deep sense of patience for self and understanding that, yes, you're not there right now, but doesn't mean you'll never get there. During my transition, I've gone through like kind of different phases of love. So pre-transition, it was learning self-love, going out there and, 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 and actively trying to love myself. The love that followed was like me relishing in that self-love. The Adam's apple is coming through. What do you think? Can you see? Being almost overwhelmed and, and, and using that love to kind of catapult me in, in different areas of my life. Letting that love spread into the music, into my family, into my friendships, into my relationships. 
when I started to actively transition and things like my body and mentality would change, it, it was a different kind of love. Love that was trying to accept the changes, accepting a new person that's, that's coming out of this transition. And right now I'm still in that state of learning to love a new version of myself. I like the fact that the phases of love have been different and I'm looking forward to the next, next stage. I'm not sure what that's going to be, but it's definitely going to be a different kind of love to what I'm experiencing now. I want to be accepted. I want you to see me as 100% normal, no different than you would see any other person walking in the street. Normalizing transness, queerness, this specific brand of masculinity is, is the way forward. That is like one of my, my biggest dreams for society is for me to be walking in the street and not worrying about what other people are thinking of me, how they view me, what they're saying about my physical appearance. Because I'm not doing that to anybody else and I just want that same respect back. I'm falling inside it now. I'm realizing the influence I have over other people and that if I can find a space to heal myself, it, it's almost like osmosis. It, you know, the people around me will start to heal and the people around them will hopefully start to heal. And that's where that responsibility then comes in back again, that because you understand that you have a great influence over people, then you can take responsibility because you understand the power that you have. I am a feminist icon. I can talk about anything and the world listens. I'm a leader, they follow. A woman will come to me, maybe there are three. One will say, oh Zotwa, your Benin pet is nice in here. I also have Benin pet underneath this Brazilian. Like take it out, someday take them off, you know. I think it's a cry for them. It's a need for them. They don't know how I do it. So if I can be given a platform to really deal with people inside, not what you see. The healing with the depression, the suicide, it comes from there. Do you love yourself? Do you accept yourself? Are you happy with yourself? If you have seen the, the movement, how women are now, they know they are powerful. They know it is uh, There's nothing wrong exposing it. Being naked, as much as I'm, I'm teaching women to be comfortable, not to be naked, but they enjoy it. So I think they, they, they see the courage, they see the scars, but they ask, how does she do it, you know? Pretty, it's generally in society. You should have a lipstick, you should have makeup, you should have manicure. They want you to be like them. So when you are not like them, it's a problem. That's why they start giving you names. When you get back home, take off your shoes. You're like, oh damn, it's been a long day. Then you take off the bra. Then you go to the basin. You are like, mm. Babies are there, my wife's la a con. Makeup remover. You are like, guess who you're gonna see there? Zoto Abanto. Oh.